Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Oslo Freedom Forum sessions on the rise of global protests or how the movements are operating in dictatorships. Of course, as the members of Oslo Freedom Forum family, you are very familiar with the fact that this is probably the largest world assembly of dissidents, and this is where we can competently talk about the autocracies, what they mean in the modern world, but also the various creative ways the activists are adopted to it. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction. Uh, we, uh, 2019 was an uh, extraordinary year when it comes to global protesting and pro-democracy struggle. It started with a, a, a kind of the episode two of the Arab Spring uh, all around the Middle East. We had uh, serious uprisings in Algeria, which ended up with the downfall of the government. We had a serious and probably best case study of uprising with transition from the coup which happened in neighboring Sudan, all of them shaking countries which were still for so many years, spread across the Mediterranean Sea, uh, impacted countries like Lebanon, then Iraq. And then on the other side of the globe, we've seen the very interesting cases happening with Morales stepping down in Bolivia. Uh, we, we want to take a look at the Far East, take no further, take a look at the Thailand, take a look at the Hong Kong. Uh, Basically, if you take a look at the statistics, the 2019 was one of the most active years of the people powers uprising. We've seen uh, uh, successes, we've seen mistakes, we've seen uh, uh, nonviolence, we've seen violence, we've seen creativity, we've seen courage, we've seen many of these things. And then COVID hit the world and the world immediately become very, very different place. Uh, according to the study uh, done by Carnegie Endowment, uh, the COVID almost everywhere impacted levels of democracy, impacted levels of social space. So many governments, both autocratic and democratic, were using this opportunity to squeeze the social space, to squeeze NGOs, to squeeze nonprofits, to squeeze the opposition. Somewhere it worked great. Somewhere it was a real crackdown on the activists, and uh, we are going to hear a lot about it from two of our today's panelists, one from Togo and one from Venezuela. Somewhere it gave people a chance to mobilize and organize and put their existing networks into use when it comes in defense of COVID. I can't stop being inspired by how the social networks established during protests in Hong Kong were actually used to inform people about the situation with COVID and keep the pretty sloppy response from the government accountable in one of the countries that were hardest hit. So there were several different outcomes when it comes to this change. A, it looks like a honeymoon for dictators. Everybody was so happy. Everybody was squeezing the social space. Uh, but then the cracks start appearing. First, the groups adopted from Malaysia to Bolivia to Hong Kong, all of these places. The groups were doing the things that the government was not doing. B, a sloppy response from the government actually propelled the very angry answer to the people. If you would ask me a year ago, would the change be possible in Belarus, where Lukashenko was in power for 26 years on the elections, I would probably say no. The guy controlled it completely. He runs the show. He runs the media. He runs the military. Uh, he keeps opposition divided. Oh, he's in a great shape. Even better, the COVID comes, so there are no opportunities for people to gather. Surprisingly, the very sloppy and, and weird response from this government, Lukashenko is among those the people who dismissed the danger of the pandemic among the most, together with Bolsonaro, Brazil, and several others. Uh, what happened was that people really feel ignited by this. There was a unity in the opposition. There were contested elections. The opposition candidate won. Election fraud was committed. And we are now witnessing a very difficult situation for a person who was solidly 26 years in power and being, uh, with a good reason, called the last standing dictator of Europe. So how the world look in 2020? How the world will look in 2021? What are the threats, but also opportunities for movements around the globe in this new pandemic situations, how the movements adapt tactically, how do they use social media, how the movements adopt strategically. Some of the movements shifted into community support organizations and thus gain a lot of, of new supporters and a lot of, of new support coming from the constituencies they were not able to reach before, before throughout the pandemic. Uh, and uh, what may be the future of some of the most important and fierce pro-democracy struggles in the world. This is what we are going to discuss today on this panel. Today with me, 
uh, three amazing activists, one of them a uh, highly ranked academic, Victoria Hui, uh, University of Notre Dame, probably the world largest expert on Hong Kong that I've ever met, Farida Naburema, the young person who single-handedly built the 20,000 strong movement against the dictatorship government in Tongo, and Rafaela Requenzis, coming from country which is probably on the uh, uh, sloppiest downside when it comes to the democracy, Venezuela. The way we are going to handle this is that these amazing people will present you with their cases. They're going to talk about these three struggles. In the meantime, please feel free to ask questions in chat. This is tend to be interactive things. I will be monitoring chat. My amazing OFF hosts will be monitoring chat and we'll make sure that the panelists get your questions once you pose them. So without further notice, I will open the case with one of the most inspiring struggles, but also one of the most depressing situations in nowadays, which is Hong Kong. Victoria Hui, the floor is yours. Mike on. Thank you, got it? Okay, great. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I think that um, for a lot of people who are not familiar with Hong Kong or China, I think a good way to start is imagine, just think about Belarus, that what if, you know, Moscow were not behind Lukashenko? And now we have Moscow, full, Putin fully behind Lukashenko. And so essentially this is kind of situation Hong Kong is in. People are not direct, not just fighting against their own government. But they're really fight. They are just they're dealing with a puppet government, Beijing appoints in Hong Kong. At the same time, you're directly confronting with this superpower, Beijing. And then how bad the situation is. Think about so you know the uh, the, the Human Rights Foundation is based in New York City. Think about New York City, taken over by Putin, taken over by Moscow, and how bad this is getting. The, this year, uh, on September 8th, there was supposed to be le legislative council elections. The government announced that they were going to, they, that they would postpone the elections for at least a year, citing COVID-19. Everyone knew that. It was an excuse because the governments knew that, even with, man with manipulation. And they had also disqualified a whole bunch of candidates, pro-democracy candidates. So even if they knew that, they could um, just disqualify a lot of the candidates. They could they could also manipulate elections and mobilize their own sol uh, iron votes that they were still going to lose. This is why that they they postponed the election, and no one knows if this is just going to be for a year or longer. And then at the same time, think about free the situation of suppression of freedom. On July first. The day after the national security, the new Beijing imposed national security law uh, took into effect, people were protesting along with the same slogan, liberate Hong Kong, a revolution of our times. And then the government said that this slogan is bad. And then people got upset. And so then they would come out protesting with blank sheets of paper. Those people got arrested too. And then we also learned that in nonviolent struggle, they use stage boycotts, use stage uh, strikes, and so medical workers, Catholic Pacific staff, a lot of these, these professionals who stage strikes, they are all subject to dismissal. And and so, and so the situation is kind of is really bad. Another thing is that there's only one pro democracy print newspaper in Hong Kong, the Apple Daily. The about 200 police officers, they stormed the, the newspaper, arrested the publisher, Jimmy Lai, along with his two sons and four top executives. This is intimidation. And just a few days ago, the police also said that, well, Hong Kong used to just recognize any, any, uh, any journalist with uh, certification from the Hong Kong Journalist Association and the Hong Kong Photojournalist Association. The police said that, no, we don't recognize this anymore. Unless, unless you're pretty much, you have to be pro regime, pro Beijing. Otherwise, all the other uh, media, especially online media, and Apple Daily included. So, if you happen to be at this particular protest site, the police rush in and then set up the cordon line. Anyone who is within the cordon line, unless you can prove that you are you are recognized as a journalist, you are subject to arrest. And the situation is this bad. So, think about if this is happening in New York City. Now, why I would say I would compare this to New York City, Hong Kong ranks only third after New York and London as the third finan largest financial center. But Beijing is killing that. And how do we get to where we are today? 
two things. One is that I would say that Hong, the Hong Kong movement, unlike most other movements in the world, it's been defensive. Defensive in the, in the sense that Hong Kong people have been trying to preserve what they've been promised, what, what they really grew up with. We could do anything, you could say whatever, done with this or that leader, no slogan would be banned. And also for a long time, police officers were trusted. And when I was a little girl, essentially you could trust police officers so much that my mom would tell me that, you know, if you get lost, go get help from my police uncle or auntie. Now the police beat you up. They detain you they, for no reason. And in detention center, people are tortured. At the same time, we've also seen many live streaming videos that police, you know, police officers just knew on people's necks and, and bones, um, essentially making sure that even whether or not you get charged or convicted or sentenced, you cannot come out to protest again. The situation is this bad, partly because I think we can go back to, to the, um, the, the, the design, why this whole idea, the Hong Kong movement is defensive. Hong Kong people were promised one country, two systems. And, it, and Hong Kong people were not really involved in this negotiation between Beijing and London in the early 1980s. But when the Sino-British Joint Declaration came out in 1984, people were like, oh, okay, this is not as bad. And then the Joint Declaration stipulates that, that all of those promises should be promulgated by Beijing's own basic law. That basic law came out in 1990. Well, what transpired between 1984 and 1990 was Tiananmen. In 1989, Hong Kong people poured to the streets. They donated money They and, and an estimation of 1.5 million people out of a population of about 6.5 at the time participated. From then on, Beijing would see Hong Kong as a base of subversion. And Hong Kong at the time had capitalism and freedom, but no democracy. But people were like, okay, this is fine. It's, it's, it should be okay. Except that the Democrats of the time understood that the only way to preserve Hong Kong's pre existing freedoms was to have democracy. Beijing learned the lesson the other way. Beijing has to deny democracy to Hong Kong so that Hong Kong cannot serve as a subversive base. And how do you deny democracy to a population that enjoy unfettered freedoms? You kill freedoms as well. So these days, freedom of the press is, is going away. Uh, the rule of law is going away. Beijing imposed a national security law on, on June 30th, essentially silencing this all kinds of dissent. And, and another lesson Hong Kong has given to the world is also that, so now we are speaking as the Oslo Freedom Forum. For Beijing, they associate the Oslo Freedom Forum with color revolutions. And at the same time, color, color revolutions are non-violence because they aim at racial change. Beijing is very worried about any kind of non-violence resistance. This is also why that they have particularly taken, taken a, a, a strong position to deny any forms of non-violence activities. So Hong Kong people last year, they participated in a long list of nonviolent activities. I mentioned strikes and boycotts usually very effective in even cases as, as uh, repressive as apartheid era, South Africa. But also that in Hong Kong to protest, you have to get a no objection permit from the police. Just by denying organizer the no objection permit, anyone who would still show up is vulnerable to arrest and torture. You know. And then at the same time, they were also basically, uh, Hong Kong also was very famous for the land wall. So people would put up these post-its, uh, uh, sticky notes, in order to sh saying that the, the aspirations for democracy, even those were taken down and demolished overnight. Hong Kong people also copy after the, the, uh, the Baltic states and forming human chains. Any, any and all of those nonviolent activities have not, have not tolerated because Beijing associates nonviolence with uh, color revolution, racial change. And so this is a lesson that we really have to take from the, the you know, as the, the world's different movements move forward. And then at the same time, in a case when you're dealing with not just your own government, your own officials, um, who may feel a little bit of responsibility to, you know, be part of the people, but you're dealing with an outside a regime that has no qualm to crack down, crack down on the population. So what could you do? And at the same time, it also turns out that it is very easy for people to, to kind of learn the lesson that nonviolence has failed us. 
And the regime apparently also really wanted to reinforce that lesson by denying any form of nonviolent resistance. And so we saw that basically people turned to fire bombs. And then there were also many cases. I would say that the most radical, the most violent cases that we saw through all of those uh, videos last year, a lot of them we have been documenting the, the situation that them were committed by police officers. Of course, uh, Sergio has been telling us that even if one person begins to pay, to pick up a, a, a brick or a stone, then it is very easy for agent provocateurs to also get into to, to escalate the violence and then blame it all on the opposition. So these are the lessons that we all have to learn. I stop here. Amazing uh, uh, analysis. Thank you, thank you, Victoria, very much. And I think we are going. Over getting some questions on Hong Kong, and especially on how the things can go forward uh, regarding police pillar. Uh, what, 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 uh, what I would like to, to point out here is that, yes, the struggle inspires world, but we also witness, and I want to underline what, what Victoria says, this uh, balance between the violence and the nonviolence and how it is related to numbers. So you have a large scale nonviolent protest, the human chain, which tens of thousands of people participate, and then the numbers go up. And at the same time, you have a, several radicals start throwing stone and you see numbers go down. We will discuss this, uh, but, but just for your short opinion, what do you think, how this dynamic is going to, 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 to develop in Hong Kong? So another thing is that also the advocates of nonviolence also argue that the repressive nature of the regime does not really affect uh, the effectiveness of nonviolence. I think that is correct because, you know, if the regime is not repressive, then there's no point for anyone to, to resist the regime. But at the same time, I've also been teaching courses on contentious politics. One thing that matters is state's capacity. So in a lot of cases when, you know, we are dealing with repressive regimes that are, that are actually weak, they cannot patrol every single inch of the territory, they cannot really control, can surveil every single dissident. But we are dealing with a regime that also has immense capacity. That, that they, could, they have even arrested um, 12 young people trying to flee from Hong Kong in the sea. We, we're still not sure if it was still in Hong Kong water or in Chinese water in open sea. But Beijing has immense capacity. When you're dealing with not just a repressive regime, but a high capacity regime, I think I've also learned from Tilly in Taro, Charles Tilly in Taro, that then there's really no other way. Any turn to violence you, is going to basically be suicidal. The only way is to continue to stick to nonviolence. When, when boycotts and strikes are also criminalized, then maybe another way is I've also been arguing that, you know, this is 3D. The, the 3D, in a sense, basically borrowing from Sergio is that diversify daily and uh, diversify daily, no, not a word, I forgot. But essentially, everyone has to continue to then live, continue to live your own life as usual. Stick to your professional principles, integrate resistance into your daily life, take very diversified met methods, and at the same time, just basically insist that you do not want to forget what you have, what has happened and the struggle. Keep that in your heart, even if you cannot go out to protest. And I think that is the only way forward. Great, Victoria. Thanks you for coming to discuss this uh, uh, even more. I think uh, what you were thinking on was destruct, dislocate, and diversify. And yes, we witnessed how this tactics of dispersion, especially strikes and boycotts, are far dif more difficult for oppressive governments to oppress than actual marches or what we call the tactics of concentration. We'll go to Hong Kong later. Uh, we already have several very interesting questions for Victoria. What's going to happen is that each speaker will have its, its, its five to seven minutes, and then I will go back to the questions. So please, I'm encouraging you to type these questions in the chat. They will all be addressed. On the scale of oppression and, and the situation from oppressive Hong Kong to even more oppressive country called Togo, with us today, Farida Naburema, human rights activist and blogger, founder of the Faure Must Go movement. Can we get some news from there, please, Farida? The floor is yours. Sorry. Thank you very much, Saja. I forgot that I, I was muted. And thank you as well, Victoria, for uh, telling us about the situation in Hong Kong, which in many ways is very 
situation in Togo, but uh, still different to uh, to many extents. Um, for those of you who don't know about Togo, um, we are led by the oldest military regime in Africa. Uh, father and son have been in power in Togo for the past 53 years. Uh, the father, Yadimanya Simbe, ruled Togo from 1967 to 1960 and then his son did a coup when he died in 2005 and he has been president since then. Um, the former school movement was funded um, by I and other Togolese young people 11 years ago um, as a response to resisting against the military regime of the son, Fawn uh, we who came in as, as, as a new figure and a young man under 40, but who needed to be faced by an, a younger opposition as well because we had generations of activists that were fighting against the Adima the father who were worn out. And when the first five years as Fonya Simi took, took power, seized power from 2005 to 2010, there was pretty much a void. Um, a void that was caused mainly by the fact that in the aftermath of the school, he exercised a whole lot of uh, uh, um, pressure on citizens and then he brutalized people. Um, when he seized power in 2005, Togolese people got on the streets and protested but then over 500 people were killed, according to the UN. So these were very brutal days um, in, in, our, in, our, in our history. Um, we have been organizing at the former school level for many years. And in 2017-18, we had a breakthrough where thousands and hundreds of thousands of Togolese started coming out on the street protesting and demanding change. The protests last for over a year, but that whole year from 2007 to 2018 were extremely brutal. The regime deployed massive repression against civilians. Uh, we had hundreds of activists who were arrested and tortured. We had thousands who fled the country and who some are, some are still living in exile till today. Um, the government invested massively on digital surveillance and infiltrated the platform that activists are using to organize, uh, um, such as WhatsApp uh, uh, um, and Facebook. And they have been able to, through that to be able to identify some activists, arrest them and put pressure on their family members. Uh, the situation in Togo today is such a way that we no longer have any form of freedom. Freedom of assembly has been banned now legally. The, the government uh, uh, passed the law in 2019, further restraining freedom of association. We can no longer organize any gathering in Togo without seeking permission. And this even applies to private gatherings. Um, just two weeks ago, some activists who organized a film screening on maternity taking in front of their house were arrested, where there was only eight of them that were organizing that screening. Um, you can't even organize a press conference in Togo. An activist was arrested uh, in 2018, and he spent 19 months in prison just because he planned a press conference, which, which didn't even take place. He was arrested for just planning a press conference. So the situation in Togo is such a way that we cannot uh, uh, um, um, organize as we used to. The few times that we tried to protest in Togo, the, the, the militaries were deployed. Many cities across Togo have been heavily militarized. We have soldiers who, as soon as they see a small group of people gathering somewhere, they, they, go, they go as far as shooting live bullets, and at some point, they even kill children as young as nine. Um, unfortunately, there are a few things that are that not playing in, in favor of Togo. Number one, the regime enjoys a whole lot of uh, 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 anonymity. Like you see the Hong Kong case, for example, globally, people know about Hong Kong and talk about Hong Kong and uh, are following what is happening there. Uh, but most people that I have met in my life that are not Togolese do not even know where Togo is and to even think about what's happening. Even neighboring countries like Ghana uh, or, or Benin, when I've met uh, even officials from there, I have no idea what was happening in Togo. So the regime kind of like plays on the fact that there is no international recognition around the situation in Togo to be able to have the, the, the freedom to, uh, to perpetrate all and carry out all those atrocities. Um, the COVID-19 situation like Sergio mentioned, has affected um, immensely uh, um, democracies and even authoritarian governments uh, uh, um, in many cases. In the case of Togo, this has been an opportunity for the regime to 
consolidates even more the power and the, uh, that they have lost in the in the over one year of, of protest. So they issued a state of emergency, and we are still under a state of emergency. The parliament passed a bill granting the president the right to make to rule by decree. So basically, he no longer has to consult anyone, not like if he used to, but at least there was a process. But even that process has been removed. Um, a law has been pa has been passed um, called the cyber um, cyber security law which basically is a law against cyber activists and which kind of like um, provides now a legal framework to arrest, try and, and detain uh, uh, um, activists for speaking against the government online. Um, they also have uh, a new law in place that uh, um, uh, kind of like prevents the press from having the freedom that it's used to. And now journalists can be arrested for publishing what they call fake news. But then the veracity of the news uh, 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 is determined by the regime. Right now, we have a journalist that is being tried because he uh, exposed a corruption scandal uh, um, involving the, the, the ruling government. And even his lawyer was arrested two days ago. Or he was uh, detained later on from the different pressure that was exercised on the government. But they went as far as arresting lawyers defending uh, the journalists in the situation. So uh, to sum up quickly, um, the reality in Togo is that we are living under a full-blown dictatorship. If you had asked me two years ago when we were in the midst of organizing massive protests, protests that gathered at some point over 1 million people on the streets uh, um, in 14 cities in Togo, and that's for a country of 8 million people, they were massive, the biggest ever in our history. We were very confident that yeah, in the coming months, or, or we, will, we will have a positive results. Unfortunately, it seems like we have only gone back. Uh, 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 we have less freedom. People are more afraid. Activists are worn out. Um, there are more legal uh, hurdles to, to the work that we are doing. So at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like we have made so much progress. Um, the only progress that maybe I can see that we made was the fact that managing to get these numbers of people on the street in Togo in over 50 years of rule of the Nyasinde family already demonstrates that the Togolese people are tired of the regime and want change. And being able to do that is enough uh, um, proof uh, to delegitimize the regime, which has always sold the, uh, uh, the story of them being loved by the people of Togo and the people of Togo being content and happy with them ruling them for all these decades. So we prove to the world and we prove to ourselves that we want change and there are hundreds of thousands and millions of us in Togo who want change by daring the regime and protesting for months. But now we have to find ways to reorganize, re-strategize and be able to continue uh, on our struggle till we hope uh, we win. This is a very interesting uh, analysis of the situation and uh, where do you think the movement from here can go forward? We were witnessing in many countries and especially in uh, corrupted, inefficient dictatorships across the globe that the movements uh, were able to use the COVID crisis. So on one hand, you know, you can always say the people stay home, they can go on the streets, the people are afraid, the gatherings are difficult, door-to-door -door work is difficult. But all mm -hmm. of these organizations actually transformed into the community-based organizations, and now they're keeping government accountable on it. Do you see somehow the weak response to the to the pandemic as a possible soft belly for for your for your government? Um, I can say that. Should I say, luckily for uh, for Togo, the pandemic hasn't caused as much. Uh, 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 um, damages as it has in the Western countries. Um, there have been less than 50 deaths reported since the beginning of the pandemic. Now, uh, we don't have any resources to verify that, but at least the situation isn't as alarming as it is in other countries to eventually cause people to panic or cause people to want to take action as a response to the pandemic. The other thing to also note is that the, the, uh, uh, um, the pandemic started in the midst of presidential elections in Togo. And these elections were pretty critical for us. Uh, although the government controlled all the electoral uh, um, bodies and, and, and drafted electoral laws, and we knew that there was very little chance that the opposition candidates were going to, to be able to claim power, 
Um, this is the first election that has been organized in Togo since the terms limits were reinstated. And the term limits are something that the Togolese people have been protesting and demanding for, for many years. It was initially in our constitution, which was removed by the Edmund Assembly, the fact that so we can stay president for life. And people have demanded this, and last year it was reintroduced in our term limits. Uh, it was reintroduced into our constitution, although it is not uh, uh, um, retroactive and does not doesn't affect the past terms of the Paris president as we wish. So the election situation itself kind of like um, had people more focused about the electoral outcomes and the, election, the elections than they are on the COVID crisis. In fact, when the government of Togo announced the first case of COVID in Togo, there was a whole lot of people, including political leaders in the opposition and activists who adamantly said it's not true that they are just making up the COVID story to prevent people from protesting the results of the elections. So there were, we, we, we went through several weeks of people being in denial of the existence of the crisis because they believed the government was manipulating the, the, the crisis to prevent people from gathering and organizing protests. So in that state, people are still uh, uh, um, uh, kind of like dealing with the aftermath of those elections, which so far I seen they uh, um, claim a fourth term. And this time along, he actually gave himself a higher number than he did in the past elections. He claimed that he won by 76% of the vote. And for on elections organized less than a year after over 1 million people protested against you, we all knew that these results uh, um, were, were, uh, were created by himself. Thank you. This was all very useful, and I invite you all to, to take a look and questions, and uh, we are going to point it to our panelists later. Uh, from Togo to even worse place when it comes to the human rights and freedoms, a country that experienced multiple level of crisis, economic meltdown, uh, a, a narco-mafia owning the government, huge levels of oppression, constitutional crisis, international isolation, and now COVID. And if you couldn't get what this country is, this is Venezuela, one of the countries with the largest natural resources and the largest human capacity in the world. So this is uh, probably the world's worst example of what the bad government can do with a country, which elsewhere can be very, 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 very prospective. Uh, joining us from a, from a fog, from Vienna fog, one of the exiled Venezuelan activists, uh, Rafaela, unmute and floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, and thanks, Farida and Professor Victoria. Um, um, thanks for letting me to talk about my country. I think it's important to say that I have dedicated myself to working for the fight for freedom, human rights, and democracy in Venezuela, and it has not been an easy task. I have seen people being murdered, unjustly imprisoned, fleeing the country and being harassed for years, even more in the frame of 2014 and 2017 protests, where more than uh, 1,500 were murdered by the dictatorship. Um, I'm sorry for the camera, it's not working at all, but well. Um, I would like to begin my, my speech today by talking to you about Captain Rafael Acosta Arevalo, and I'm going to read this and then you will know why. According to the autopsy performed on his body, he had 38 bounds on the front and back of his body and broken nasal septum, abrasion on his shoulder, elbows and knees, and bruises on several parts of his body, including his thigh, buttocks and back. Captain Acosta Arevalo's body also showed a broken foot and signs of burn to his foot and wrist. The official cause of death was severe cerebral edema due to acute respiratory failure, due to muscle breakdown caused by generalizing multiply trauma. That's it, basically, due to having suffered multiple traumatic injuries. Captain Acosta Revalo was kidnapped and arbitrarily detained by the security force of the Nicolas Maduro regime. He was subjected to further disappearance and torture and other cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment were committed against him. 
to the point of causing his death. This case is just one of the more than 40 cases documented in the UN Independent International Fact Finding Mission Report, published just, few, uh, just a few days ago. A report that affects me personally, um, because one of those cases in the, uh, is the one of my brother, Deputy Juan Requesens. Uh, he was kidnapped more than 500 days ago. After six months of fighting during the pandemic, uh, a humanitarian measure was granted for him. My brother is at home, but he is not uh, free yet, the same way Venezuela is not free. The UN report described uh, the suffering of torture, imprisoner, and murder of people, the suffering of their families, mothers who had to go every day to a prison to send food to their innocent sons and daughters. Kids who, who grow up without their moms, and that's because the government kidnapped them because they had a sign with the word freedom on it, because they tweeted something or just because someone just didn't like them. I'm not here to, I'm not here only to tell you histories. Um, I'm here to tell you that we need to do something about what's happening in Venezuela. Years ago, the international community didn't understand what we were facing. Now it's been largely documented and you, we as, um, as humanity need to act, to take action. We need you to put on the place of, of my people, of the Venezuelan people. And, and I want you to imagine it, that you are one of the victims, that your nails are being pulled out with tweezer in order to bend your will. Imagine that you are and a man in a police uniform kidnapped you. Imagine the fear, um, the, vulnerab the vulnerability, the horror that meets feeling you will never see your family again. And imagine that it's not being just about political activism. It's about everything that has happened in my country because of the decision of a group of psychopath criminals involved in drug trafficking and crimes against humanity. And let me be clear on this. This is not just a Venezuelan issue. Everything are going through affect the entire region. Um, and I will say an important part of the world. This regime has proven relationship with dictators, terrorists, organizations, and criminals around the world. This is the time to stop looking to other side. Um, the world has historical being doing that and raising their voice when it's already too late. Right now, uh, we have the opportunity to act, to raise our voices in other order to stop the echo side in the meaning arc of Guyana, the Venezuela refu refugee crisis, the humanitarian crisis and the crimes against humanity. We need to act now. Thank you so much. A uh, bleak picture, really, Rafaela. And uh, uh, my my first question to you is is just to before we jump to the question and answer session is uh, how this is different now from 2019. Seems seems that you had a wave of protest 2017 and it, it was happening later, and then you have this big international buzz and everybody was thinking Maduro is very likely to go. So how the situation is different now, and uh, what do you think may be the way forward? Rafael, are you there with me? Sorry, I was muted. Um, the difference uh, from the last year to from today? Um, well, right now, I think uh, the coronavirus situation in Venezuela was a perfect uh, moment to the uh, Nicolas Maduro regime to uh, put all the people inside the house and every day the situation gets worse. Uh, the people right now uh, doesn't have gas, gasoline for the cars. So you have to stay in your home because if you go out without uh, permissions, maybe you go, um, you will go to the jail because you don't have the permission. So 
all the situation, uh, the crisis um, gets worse because uh, we don't have gas in the capital. The, pro the gas problem in the country uh, always has been in the in all the country, but not in the capital. So right now, uh, all the problems are in Caracas, the the capital, and and this is what a good this was a good opportunity to Maduro like um, have an opportunity to breathe because the people can't go out to the street to protest because of the coronavirus. And if it's not the coronavirus, you go into the jail. And the political situation, I mean, the parliamentary situation, the President Guaido situation is really hard right now because of the coronavirus. And if you get sick right now from corona, uh, it's going to be really hard to, uh, to recuperate because the health situation in Venezuela is getting worse right now. The doctors right now doesn't have uh, the material to to save the people, to attend the people from Corona. The refuge crisis has dependent. People is literally dying because they have nothing to eat. And an entire generation of kids is condemned to psychical and mental damage because of hunger. Uh, the difference from last year example is because is that we don't have a pandemic and so this this wasn't as um, an opportunity to the regime to to make the lockdown and the difference from the 2017 is that in 2017 we have a big and a huge movement in the streets and we didn't maybe we didn't realize what the regime was going to do like they are going to murder they are going they are going to kill sorry they are going to to do the worst things uh, that our nation has lived in all the history speaking of of this situation seems that uh, you guys need a lot of help and one of the purposes of also freedom forum is uh, to give the people a platform so they can state their case and maybe get support sometimes from fellow activists sometimes from people with influence uh, that relates to the first question that i got in chat for victoria and i will then redirect it to rafaela so when you take a look at what we call the third parties or external players uh, in the game, what do you think? Uh, maybe, maybe how the international community continues support Hong Kong now that the national security law is enacted, and many activists are fearful about connecting with international organizations or speaking to other government. Is this uh, international pressure working uh, in this case? And I will repeat the same question, but with very different shape to Rafaela. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for this question. Unmute first. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. I would also like to just echo what Faridas said earlier about international attention, that everyone pays attention to Hong Kong and almost no one pays attention to Togo. I think Hong Kong does benefit from that. But just kind of like what my uh, doc primary doctor said, whatever happens, Hong Kong is an international city. Whatever happens in Hong Kong, everyone else cares. At the same time, Hong Kong is also the base for many international companies and international media organizations. For example, the New York Times, I kept getting calls and from, you know, a dozen different people. And I was asking how many people in Hong Kong. And so probably there's, there's, there's I don't know if there's even one New York Times reporter covering Togo, Togo. But the situation gets really bad is that international journalists are now are not getting their visa renewed. And at the same time, even judges are resigning. There is this danger that Beijing is really trying to get a lot of these international foreigners, observers, who would otherwise be there to you know, compile reports, to maintain a sense of opening, to maintain professional ethics and all that, to make sure that they are gone and then Beijing can do whatever it likes. Now, at the same time, I think that at the same, you know, when we talk about mobilization, it's always about both domestic mobilization and international mobilization. I think what Hong Kong people are very good at this time around is international mobilization. Last year, uh, Hong, Kong, Hong Kong, at the same time, I've been in the U.S. for a long time. And it was really from last year that I finally began to, to know other Hong Kong Americans, other Hong Kong people in the U.S., Hong Kong people have, overseas Hong Kong people have been very organized like never before. 
And then we also form, for example, I'm a founding mem member of the Hong Kong Democracy Council. We have been lobbying the Congress to pass these Protect Hong Kong bills. We managed to get the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act passed last year, and then the Hong Kong Autonomy Act passed this year. But at the same time, I would also say that um, two things. One is the national security law, I think, not just to criminalize both violent and nonviolent resistance in any kind of dissent, but it, as they put it, it criminalizes secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion. Now, terrorism, this definition includes setting roadblocks or obstructing government's functioning. The definitions are very, very big. Basically, they catch all. But then also, when it comes to Chinese law, we know that it doesn't really matter what the, you know, what the law actually says in black and white. It's, it's, it is whatever the, the, the authorities is, think it is. But it is important to see also the, act, the, the, the criminalization of collusion. So I... Hong Kong. Unfortunately, I'm a US citizen, but I cannot go back to Hong Kong because uh, I've been criticizing the national security law and because of my involvement in lobbying Congress to pass these Protect Hong Kong Acts. It is possible one, one could say that, you know, maybe if that's the case, maybe, you know, all the international mobilization has backfired. I would say no, it's just because it is true that we are very effective. Uh, at the same time, if not because of international attention, Hong Kong would actually have fallen much in a much worse situation and much more rapidly that is currently the case. I would also say that, for example, the very prominent activists, Jimmy Lai, Joshua, and his child, the more attention is paid to them, the better, the more protection that they get. Or the, the 12 um, um, young people who were trying to flee Hong Kong and got detained by mainland security, now that they, they are in det detention, probably subject to torture, and, and the family members, we know, don't know what happened to them. Family members have no access to them. Again, the more international attention is focused on them, the better the treatment that they get. So it, 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 international attention is very important. But at the same time, it is also very important that it is not just about which particular country doing the work. Because when if the, if only the US imposes sanctions on China, then China always can turn to European countries to play this divide and conquer. Presuming that you know everyone wants to have, continue to have the, a, big, a big share of the China market, they will continue to silence themselves. HSBC, for example, an international bank, because it makes so much of its money from Hong Kong and China. Therefore, it has been forced to pledge support for the national security law, even before the law was made known. Nobody has seen it until the moment it was promulgated at the 11th hour on June 30th. And so it is, it, the situation is really dire, but at the same time, it is very important for all the democracies to come together. And the more that we do this, and I think that the, the, the TOCO is really a, a, a counterexample to support the case, international attention matters. Even if that, may, that makes the regime more nervous and then imposes a heavier crackdown. That's a very interesting point because we, we explore different effectiveness of what we call the third party players. And obviously uh, the part of this is, is, uh, is a PR thing that, that China wants to avoid. But in the same time, as you explained, a uh, very important thing is that uh, uh, Hong Kong is a very international city and most of its economy is tied into this global bloodstream of money and information. And it would be very difficult to cut this thing just out of the patch. And, you know, since you are an island, we are going to surround you with a wall because many of the people will be upset and that will that will definitely impact terribly the Hong Kong economy. So speaking of international support and world getting together, we witnessed a huge amount of world getting together behind the president of the Venezuelan legitimate parliament, Juan Guaido, two years ago. And we even uh, witnessed that the countries were recognizing Guaido and then expelling Venezuelan diplomats and on, on, on their way, there was a Guaido diplomats and there was this overtaking of the diplomacy pillar of Venezuela by the opposition, which was, in my opinion, very successful. Uh, did it really help? Can can this thing be, be forced from the outside? Uh, what else needs to be on the inside? And especially with this situation, 
what role the huge Venezuelan diaspora can play. We are now talking about the millions of people that were literally kicked out from the country, which is falling apart. Uh, how do you see this, Rafaela? You live now in Europe. What are the people's sentiments? Is this topic still hot? And is there something that the Venezuelans or the people who want to support democracy in Venezuela can do to make the support stronger? You know, uh, you say something really important than two years ago. Uh, Juan Guaido and, and all the situation get the recon uh, he gets recognized by a lot of countries, and that happened because of the protest from 2017 and um, I want and, and 2014, but especially from the 2017. All uh, what is happening right now and and the the reason right now that the venezuela that venezuela is like in the table for all the international uh, community is because of the protest and because of the situation there get worse every day uh i get what uh, professor victoria said about it being um peer thing i think there was a lot of lobbies that were actually working before and right now there's these supports are more weak um, I think the UN report uh, was a punch. I mean, the report for, uh, to the situation of Venezuela was a punch on the table um, because they can't keep hiding it. Um, when you talk about crimes against humanity, everyone gets worried because it's something so big. It's not uh, something normal. No, it, it's something really important to understand. Um, we have to see yet that will be the consequence of it all. But right now, the crisis is clear for so many countries that have Venezuelan refugees or that have been affected by Venezuelan issues that today every effort needs to, uh, to be not only increased, but unite because, as I said before, it affects not only my people, it's affecting a lot of people around the world. So um, I think the best support is to keep raising our voice uh, in these spaces, in every spaces, in, in medias. Uh, I really want to invite you to read this report and to talk about it. It's devastating. It's, it's really hard um, actually for me and, and for everyone to read it because it's so explicit and said a lot of, of, of of the heartbreaking situation right now is really explicit of each case and this has to be um a, a thing to take and share it and and one thing that i always say and i would like to say it here is that rafaela requesens is not only fighting for make a change in venezuela um i want uh, that the situation in Venezuela teach to the people in other countries and the people around the world that this kind of things can happen. And it's not only happening in Venezuela, it's happening in, in different countries around the world. It's, uh, our different government that are making, uh, are committing crimes against humanity. And a lot of people doesn't know that. So this should be uh, uh, something to teach to the people because we have to take really strong the democracy, the freedom, the, the democracy values and principles and never let it go. Because Venezuela, a lot of years ago, what, uh, was a rich country, was a democracy, a democratic country. Um, and right now we are in this situation. So this is a message for the people who are here that the fight for Venezuela it has to be an example to know that we can um, give our country to this kind of people. This has to be uh, an example of what we have to to fight and and the way we have uh, and and the way we we like and we have to live. Uh, this is a very good message. Uh, two questions uh, that I think I will first pop to to Farida to give her chance to take a role. 
back to Victoria because uh, Hong Kong case is so unique. Uh, one is the question of, of, of uh, uh, the importance of, of uh, media freedoms and and uh, and uh, and communication freedoms is hard. So so do, what is what are the levels of of the social media censorship and how this influences people? I mean, I, I witnessed both cases. I witnessed when the media censorship actually was bringing the people number down, but also there were cases in Arab Spring where you have the maximum of the people on the street at the time when the government cut down the internet. We're also witnessing how Belarusians, due to the media restrictions, are turning to Telegram, which is unrestricted. So uh, uh, it figures out that somehow this media crackdown can be uh, in benefit of oppressive government, but it also can backfire. Farida, what's the situation in Togo with this? How you communicate with the people there? How the people mobilize, organize, and share information? Mike, Mike, Mike. Magical button. So, um, in Togo, when the government shut down the internet, amazingly, it backfired because more people were curious and wanted to know what's happening. And, and some other people who were not active in the movement got pissed off. Like, they were like, how dare you cut off our source of communication with the outside world? And, and it actually also increased the attention and the participation of the Togolese in the diaspora because they couldn't communicate with people back home anymore uh, as they used to. They started getting worried for their family members and they just wanted people to be done with the, uh, 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 with the regime. So we saw diaspora participation increase and the protests were even higher during the time of the internet shutdown than it was during the time of regular communication. But the, 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 during the past elections, the government shut down the internet again, but Telegram was open, so people were using Telegram as well in Togo. But before Telegram, in 2017, before Telegram became vulgarized as it is today, the amazing tool of communication that the police people were using was Bluetooth. And that is, that is quite surprising, uh, because people don't usually communicate via Bluetooth, but the thing is, um, you can share audio messages to people in your network, in your Bluetooth network, uh, within a certain parameter. And the way the things were done was that we will record audio messages and ask people to share them by Bluetooth and ask people to own their Bluetooth and accept Bluetooth messages. And they were gathering sharing points where people were going just to receive um, uh, information and audio messages, especially in the rural areas. People even prefer using Bluetooth than uh, 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 WhatsApp or Telegram because you to spend on any data uh, to transfer a file on YouTube. You don't even need to have the internet or you don't even need a smartphone to accept Bluetooth devices, uh, or Bluetooth um, uh, 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 communication and, and, and messages. So Bluetooth was one of the most uh, uh, highly used uh, methods of communication and information sharing in Togo. It figures out that, that somehow people find their way even with the internet restrictions. Victoria, are these internet restrictions are becoming more often in Hong Kong? And also other uh, very interesting question is about the thing we mentioned and we may want to talk a little bit more is explaining these concepts of pillars. So why it is so important for nonviolent movement to understand that the change is structural and their strategy needs to affect structures rather than just being a random protest on the street. And of course, Hong Kong is a unique example because you have a very strong Chinese, let's say, third party pillar or, or whatever external pillar. And then at the same time, you have this presence of international companies, which kind of complicates the picture. So uh, internet restrictions and pillars in Hong Kong. Thank you. So when it comes to internet control, this is actually coming to Hong Kong. As soon as the national security law came into effect, many people switched out of WhatsApp, Telegram, and use and downloading uh, Signal. Signal is probably the only secure uh, chat app at the moment. And then at the same time, uh, a week after the government uh, announced the national security law, they announced a different set of procedures require, requiring all the, the service providers, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, what have you, that they are, if they are asked to provide data to the authorities, they have to do so. If they, if they fail to, to comply, they are subject to imprisonment and the heavy fine. 
immediately all of these companies got together to say that we are suspending this request, we're not processing this request altogether. So far, we haven't really heard anything about this, but then we know that, you know, basically Beijing is just doing all kinds of stuff to crack down Hong Kong. They're doing multiple things at the same time. So we expect that, you know, one of these days they're going to come back to this issue, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and the like, what's that? You guys want to, to keep your business in Hong Kong, comply with our regu new regulations, or you move out. New York Times already moved out its data center to Seoul and just keeping its reporters working in Hong Kong for, exactly for fear of this. And then the second question about the policy support. So of course, this is Sergio's um, innovation, right? That when we're dealing with a regime, we have to look at what, you know, we have, we're dealing with not just, so resistance power structure is not just a pyramid. You are not just trying to target at the top guy, but rather that we have to see power as like a house with different pillars. So at the top, then, you know, however ruthless a dictator is, he or she cannot, usually he cannot really do everything on his own. Most of all security forces, those in uniform, and they can be regular police, can be secret police, can be thugs, can be the military. And then you also have other pillars. Very often we're talking about the church, the education system, the press, and all of these different pillars. Oh, the, the law court is very important. What Beijing has been doing, it's going back to my earlier points that Beijing understood, so while Hong Kong people believe that we really have to fight for democracy in order to preserve our freedoms, uh, what I would call different pillars of freedoms, very similar to this idea that we, we should have the impartial police force, very, very professional civil service, the free press, the, the law courts, it are completely independent and impartial. So Beijing learned the lesson that if we want to deny democracy, where, while these people enjoy unfettered freedoms to keep demanding, and the more you deny democracy to these people, the more people show up over the last 20 some years. Every, basically, the, the protest movement grew over time because Beijing was trying to deny democracy to Hong Kong people. And with the protest last year, because it was literally an explosion of anger, Beijing decided that, well, maybe the, the ultimate solution to, to denying democracy is to kill freedoms. And so Beijing is targeting at every single pillar. So in a way that I would say, well, that for, so for, for those of us who work on nonviolence, it's it, on the one hand, we want to look at, you know, if you are in the opposition, look at the state structure, look at what pillars of support they have and how we can tear, pull them over to your side or undercut them. But what is interesting is that they, we have to, you know, because resistance is a chess game. We also have to see what the regime also have learned. They seem to be very well versed with everything that Sergio has written or has talked about. And so, oh, these guys talk about pillars of support. So we are also going to undercut these pillars as well. So education is being undercut by firing professors and by firing teachers who, who have, you know, even if they put up a Facebook post, go Hong Kong. Um, and then yellow businesses, yellow meaning for democracy. A lot of them, are sub you know, it's not illegal. It's not illegal to that you put, you know, that you support the democracy movement, right? So then, what they do is they have they that people actually come, came up with a list of all the yellow businesses. So if you uh, as you support democracy, you should go these to these places. Now, of course, once you have this list, the police also knows, you know, the targets for harassment. And then, of course, essentially, the national security law also aims to completely undercut Hong Kong's the most fundamental pillar, the rule of law, the independent judiciary, by bringing in uh, the, the mainland jurisdiction and also by setting up a different court to, to handle national security cases. So this, these are the things that we, are, that we have to really look at the tug of war. But then going back to what we talked about earlier is that Dealing with this situation, a very smart, repressive, and high capacity regime. Ultimately, we have to just go back to more innovative ways of, uh, of resistance. And Sergio early on was added, you know, decentralized, diversified daily, but also try to dis distract the opponents and also try to dislocate the, the, the opponents, the regime. So maybe Sergio can add to that, elaborate on these. I think to an end, I 
The, the, these were some very important highlights on, on these three interesting struggles and dynamics. And I think what connects you guys all, that you have the bravery and courage, but you are on a defense at the actual situation. But that doesn't mean that, that things can't be rebuilt. And as Victoria said, any sound strategy for nonviolent movement start with understanding the battlefield and doing this pillar analysis. So why the Guaido is targeting only military, only military, only military, only military? Well, there are so many different pillars to target. And when he targets the international community, it becomes extremely successful. So how you diversify uh, what you do in, in the certain situation? How do you move from mass street protests, even the protests in millions like we have in Tongo, into the sound strategy of undermining the key pillars of the, of the regime? How we figure this out and what we can do uh, to help this, this is a very interesting thing. And I think this is why this type of sessions and this type of gatherings like also Freedom Forum are particularly important because uh, for me, I've never seen better way to learn than from people who experienced it. So this horizontal learning, sharing opinions and understanding that we are not alone in this, in this world of autocracy really helps people to figure out. And because the other people have done it in desperate situations, they tend to be uh, more prominent and, and, and trying to do these things up. Uh, before I conclude and say how much I appreciate all of you guys being on stage, I will give you one more sentence to tell me where do you think your struggle is going and what is the most important thing for the struggle you are outlining, and I'll start with Rafaela. Can you read the? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. What maybe if there is one thing we can all do to help Venezuelans, what would that be? Uh, talking about the reality. I mean, sounds really basic but we have to inf to informate what is really happened because the regime of Nico because nicolas maduro's regime uh, through the years with chavez they made a lot of connections around the world and a lot of channels uh, and a lot of governments around the world support uh, still support the reality of of the venezuela the crisis so what we need to 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 make is like a, 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 the, the real information because in Venezuela we don't have um, uh, uh, channels to, to informate what is happening. So the social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, uh, we need all of these uh, like channels or social media to communicate, so for us, it's really important to talk about the situation. And um, maybe for uh, some people, it's going to sound really basic too, but uh, you can't imagine that what, feel, uh, what we feel when we see something like a tweet supporting Venezuela. Maybe that tweet is not going to take down the, the reality and, and it's not going to take down the Nicolás Maduro, but that made um, uh, uh, like a light for that people that we are not alone. So talking about the reality of Venezuela and supporting through the social media because it's the way that we have to, to see what the countries and what the world is saying about Venezuela. It's just talking about the reality and and not um, and not uh, not lay not letting that the communists and socialists around the world uh, say lies about what we are living because Nicolas Maduro right now has a powerful uh, communication around the world to say that everything that is happening is not happening. So we need help in that. That I think that's the most important thing to do. Okay, getting the truth about Venezuela out as, as one of our homeworks. Uh, Farida, what do you think it's most important for Toga at this time and how we all in the Social Freedom Forum community may help? Right. 
Um, thank you very much, Saja. What I'm going to say really joins what Rafaela was saying in a moment. Uh, international support means a lot. Um, it, it, it does impact in many ways. It kind of like weakens the regime credibility outside, but it also gives a sense of hope, belonging, and a moral support to those on the ground. It fuels them in such a way that they feel like people are watching, they are not alone in their struggle, and they can count on them one way or another to reach their goals. So yes, we do need that international support as well. The word needs to get out. Unlike other countries that have uh, uh, um, that have gained enough atten a lot of attention internationally, Togo remains in in very in a lot of darkness. Um, very few people in the world know that the longest military regime in Africa is in a small country called Togo of 8 million people uh, uh, in West Africa. So we do need to get the word out. We need more people to join us in getting the word out and also people to be out there to support Togo these activists in their advocacy effort and in their lobbying efforts as well. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had much response or support from the US government or even other foreign governments against the human rights abusers in Togo. Um, and we do want to see that happen. We want the Togolese government to be held accountable at least somewhere if we are unable to use the justice systems in our country to hold them accountable. Being able to do that in other countries is going to send a strong message, not only to them, but to the people of Togo, who can now rest assured that they are not alone in the struggle and they should continue fighting. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Farid and Rafaela. Any last thoughts, Victoria? You know, I, I, I echo uh, what Rafaela and Farida said. It is very important to keep the reality and international support is very important to Hong Kongers still in Hong Kong, that this is the expression of solidarity matters a lot to them. I also wanted to quickly point out one thing is that we also have to face the reality of what China is, that it's the Chinese communist regime, because many people, especially, you know, uh, uh, many people in democracies often associate China with this, you know, uh, anti-imperialist, uh, a, a left-wing regime, and therefore whatever the US does is evil, whatever China does is probably excusable and justifiable. No, we are dealing with a fascist re regime that is imposing genocide on uh, Mongolians, Tibetans, and Uyghurs, and it is killing Hong Kong. So let's really take the reality of what the CCP stands for and stand with Hong Kong. Uh, thank you all for participating in this. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, Rafaela. Thanks, Farida. Always pleasure uh, seeing you. Always pleasure uh, sharing uh, thoughts on this. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions. Keep these words in mind. What we can do to help? Some of us have a lot of Twitter following. Some of us have connections. Some of us know donor organizations. Some of us speak to diplomats. Uh, some of us, like myself, have certain skills that people may need. Uh, I would like to assure you all that uh, this is the family of the people who share and who care for each other. And please uh, continue doing this. Thanks you once again for today's session. Keep up tuned for the rest of also Freedom Forum. And more important, keep the solidarity in fight for global democracy. Sergei Popovich, Executive Director of Canvas, cutting off.